Good evening. Oh my goodness, I don't think I heard a single response there. Let's try that again. Good evening. All right. One more time. Good evening. That's I'll accept that. All right. uh, welcome to the second to last program. I can't believe it's already the second to last. I think I said that last week that I couldn't I believe it's the third to last. But, uh, second to last program of the 2023 Great Stone Viaduct Lecture Series. Um, looks like we've got a great turnout tonight, so thank you all for coming. I hope to see you all back next week for our last program of this an annual series. So it's the last time you're gonna be able to do this for another year. So please come back. Uh, this course is the 10th year the library has partnered with the Great Stone Viaduct Historical Education Society to bring these programs to you. And as always, we're grateful for that partnership. It's a lot of work to put these series together and we've had a wonderful turnout this year, thanks to people like you. So again, thank you for coming out tonight and uh, coming to our series. Uh, as a reminder, if you can't make it to our final program tomorrow or next week, we do live stream our programs. They're live streamed on our Facebook, the library's Facebook page, and we have a YouTube channel. And the day following the program, we also put the videos on our website. So you have three different places that you can see those videos if you can't come to the program. If you missed any of the previous programs, they're all up online and you can watch them as well. Um, if you're new to the library, if you need to use the bathrooms at any point, they're through the hallway and then turn to the left, there's another hallway in the the bathrooms are on either side there. And then I do ask that everybody silence their cell phones now out of respect for our speaker tonight. This Friday, this coming Friday, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, we'll, we'll be starting a new book club here at the library. It's called Bookaholics Anonymous Book Swap. That's the title that the staff came up with. Uh, it works a little bit differently from a normal book club. So instead of everybody reading the same book every month, um, Everybody reads a book somebody else recommended, and then once a month, the participants will come back to the library to discuss whether or not they liked the book that they chose or was chosen for them. Um, so stop in this Friday, March 17th, anytime during open hours, 9 to 5 p.m. You can drop your book rep your book title recommendation, and we've got a little leprechaun hat because it's St. Patrick's Day, and then pull another one out, and whatever title you pull out, we'll get you here at the library. Um, you can come and pick it up. If it's, we don't have it in the library, we'll order it. You can come and pick it up. And then in April, we'll have a potluck, and everybody can say if they love the title or they hated it, and then we can uh, pick new titles. So come back in April, date to be announced, and we'll have a potluck. We'll discuss our book grabs, and then we'll do another round of recommendations at random to read for the following month. And then just quickly on the back table, there are brochures for our story times for kids ages three to six, and also for Dolly Parton's Imagination Library program. If you're not familiar with it, it's a wonderful program that's funded both state, by the state and locally. Um, and th through the program, kids ages newborn to five get one free book every month. It's delivered by mail. Um, they're age appropriate and it's at no cost to the parents at all. Um, even newborns can be signed up, so please do us a favor and on your way out, grab brochures for both of those programs. And if you know any families that have young kids, please distribute those for us. And now to tell you a little bit more about the Great Stone Viaduct Historical Education Society and uh, to talk, introduce tonight's speaker, <laughs> I'm going to pass the podium on to the committee chair for the Great Stone Viaduct Lecture Series, Erica Keller. Thank you. have trouble. I have to stand on my tiptoes. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, this is our second to last. Uh, we're almost wrapping up our 2023 season, and it's been a wonderful season. Thank you all so much for coming out. Um, as always, um, we are always looking for new members of the Great Stone Viaduct Society, so if you would be interested in becoming a member, um, please join us at the back table after the lecture, and we've got lots of literature for you to look over. Um, one thing that we do um, do as one of our main fundraisers, um, if you guys have been to the walking trail um, in the plaza area, you might have noticed um, each one of our arches is a commemorative mark. Um, and we still have three arches available, but time is kind of of the essence. We are trying to finish up our arches, get our, um, our placards done and mounted so that we can finish the plaza. Um, we, we have three arches. 
uh, the Education Arch, the Building of America Arch, and the In Memoriam Arch. If you would be interested in purchasing uh, a, a ringstone, keystone, um, anything uh, in one of those arches, please let us know. Uh, we do have that information on the back table. And uh, that then if you've seen them in the plaza, the names are commemorative on the, the placards in underneath each arch. It's, it's very, very beautiful. And uh, we are getting into those phases where we are finishing all the placards. So if you're interested, please let us know. Um, so I'm getting very nervous. I'm like, shaking. Um, so I have the distinct pleasure this evening. Um, week to week, you guys always see me introduce people all the time. And some of them I know, and some of them I don't know. Um, but tonight, I do know our speaker very well. I was very honored that he agreed to speak here tonight. And I was just very pleased. Um, I first met Mr. Tom Radizak when I was a about my daughter's age. I was a, a sophomore. Um, and I remember hearing about Advanced English 10. Uh, it was a college preparatory class. and It was really hard. That's what everybody said. Um, so I you know, rose to the challenge. I can do it. College prep. I didn't know how much I would love it. And I didn't know how much for the next two years I would be transferring one person in one class. Um, very few people I know in my age group um, do not know the fight song or the alma mater because we memorized it in Mr. Radizak's class. Um, and I know every word and I can still sing it. Um, also, all the, uh, the things that we learned in there that just made us better in every aspect, uh, debates, um, the thrill of crushing someone in debate became very real. Um, it wasn't an assignment. It was, it meant something. You were coming for somebody. You're going to do well in that debate. And uh, the sweet victory of winning. Uh, memorizations, um, inspirational poems. Um, in my teaching career, one of my very first gifts that I gave one of my students was a framed copy of The Bridge Builder. And it just meant so much to me. And um, Mr. Radizek is a personal hero of mine. I felt not only uh, educated, but I really learned what the true meaning of the word inspire is. And not only to be inspired, but to inspire others. And um, it gave me a lot of the courage to do things that I've done in my own life uh, because I was inspired so much. And I hope I even become a small fraction of the teacher that Mr. Radizek was for me. So please put your hands together and welcome Mr. Tom Radizek. This work? Yep. Um, begin tonight. This is unrelated to the um, speech, but I've been in every high school in the Ohio Valley Athletic Conference, all 50 of them. Um, and I've seen some beautiful new buildings being built with all their glass, all their openness, and everything else. But I'm telling you, point blank. That is the most beautiful high school I think you will ever see anywhere, any place. Um, I love that building. I love the way it is. There was a lot of debate whether it should be torn down during the remodeling, but um, um, I'm glad that they kept it up there. Um, before we begin tonight, there's something I need to clarify with you. Um, I am not by, by any means a historical person. Um, I truly admire people who can cite names and dates and events and, and, and just flip them off at ease. I'm always in awe at what they can do. Um, I read Dan Frizzi's article a couple weeks ago on King Solomon White. Um, I've read Dan Frizzi's article or books on railroads. I've read Dan Frizzi's book on growing up on Washington Street. That people is historical research. Um, Doug Huff's not here. I don't see it. Um, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Doug Huff, if you're athletically inclined, that I would defy you to go up to him and ask him any athlete, any event that occurred in the Valley back into the 40s or 50s, the man can recite him. He's a walking encyclopedia. Um, but that's not who I am. Um, matter of fact, when Eric called me and said, would you be interested in doing this after I quit laughing? Um, the first thing... <laughs> I said to her, is, is what in the world would I talk about? Um, because I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so if you're expecting a, a history lesson or a, a lesson of history of some sort tonight, 
I apologize in advance for disappointing you. I, I think you will pick up if you listen carefully. I think you will pick up the message by the end. There's like a the, the, the climax. Um, so we'll see how good you are when you do it. But with that being said, we'll get started. Um, it was the summer of, of 1968. Um, I had just graduated from college, um, just gotten married, and had just finished um, my first year of teaching at Bridgeport Schools. At this point, I was taking the summer off to um, paint my parents' house. Um, back in those days, that's what we called student loan repayment. So <laughs> I'm, I'm working painting their house. Um, I'm out on the roof painting the windows, and my mother comes and hands me the phone and says that, um, Bob Wee is on the phone, wants to talk to me. Now, if you're paying attention, the first thing you should notice is, wait a minute, you said 1968, you were out on the roof. Um, they didn't have cell phones back then, but it was my parents' bedroom. So the phone was right inside the window. I was outside the window on, on the roof of there. And she said, um, Bob Wee wants to speak with you. Now, Bob was the... Um, owner operator of Hires Nesbitt Bottling Company on 34th and Monroe Street, right where the Rose Hill Towers are now. And, and I had worked for Bob for um, all the way through high school, college, doing odd jobs, um, making pop runs up to Youngstown, things of that nature. So I answered and, and um, being the board of uh, the president of the Board of Education, he asked me if I'd be interested in a teaching job at Blair. Um, I said, no, no, wait a minute. Bridgeport, I had just finished a year there. Bridgeport was very good to me. Um, Russ DeVault, right in the middle of my student teaching career, or student teaching episode, and, and um, Russ DeVault, the superintendent, came in and said, would you like a job teaching at Bridgeport? And I said, I still got half my student teaching to go through. He says, doesn't matter. I'll take care of that. Are you interested in the job? Um, one of the teachers had a nervous breakdown, which should have been a flu, <laughs> and was not going to be the back. Um, and he says, would you be interested in the job? I said, sure. When would I start? He goes, Monday. Um, I said, okay. So I was a little leery about leaving Bridgeport, but to come back to Belair, come back to your home school and teach was like a, a dream come true. So I said, yeah, I'll be interested. He said, well, then I need you to go down to the high school and um, have an interview with Mr. Dixon. Now, the other thing you have to understand is um, my dad was a bus supervisor for several years. And, and let's say him and Mr. Dixon had um, uh, they several disagreements. So I was not anticipating getting this job. But out of respect to Mr. Wee, I thought, OK, I'll get down for the interview. Well, actually, the interview went better than what I thought it was. And he said, um, you know, if you're interested, I need you to go to a second interview with Mr. Spurk. Um, Mr. Spurk, you will remember, was a band director, but was also the assistant principal. And at that time, Ed Garda was um, on vacation. So Mr. Spurk says um, he wanted to do the interview. So I went to talk to him. He said, OK, you're going to be teaching um, General English 12, and I need you to advise the yearbook. Excuse me? He said, yeah. He said, we need a yearbook advisor. And he says, you were on the yearbook staff, right? And I said, yeah, but not to that degree. Well, that kind of came with it. So I said, OK. So I returned to my alma mother, young, brash, energetic, and totally clueless. I um, had no idea what I was getting myself into. But I survived my first year. And I was able to produce the first yearbook, but I found it very difficult um, tracking down information at the end of seasons and having accurate information at that point. So the idea came up that I would cut out all the articles from the newspapers. Now, for those of you who are as old as I am, you remember the Times Leader used to be the source of information. It was a newspaper. The Intelligence or the News Register, those were the good old newspapers. If you're used to seeing them today, not even a comparison. But I thought, okay, we'll cut out all the pictures and we'll put them together in this big oversized scrapbook, these great big scrapbooks. 
So cut the pictures out, and glue them down there. So at the end of each season, we'd have something to go back and, and reference. Um, the, the problem that we encountered was that this space, this took up a lot of space. You had to have the space to um, cut you had the, the, the um, rubber cement and whew, that was good stuff. But we had to have all the rubber cement um, and, and clean things up and everything. And it took up more space than what I had anticipated. I needed more room. All I had was one classroom, um, which ironically was 332. And I taught 31 years in that same classroom. Um, it, was a, it was a neat thing to have. So at this point, enter the janitors. Um, George Snyder was one of the, there were three janitors. I can't remember who the third one was, but George Snyder and George Miller. Um, they, they were two um, cat birds to say that the least. But understand, I had grown up learning to walk in the Belair schools, literally. My dad was an industrial arts teacher for 30 years. So I got to know the, the faculty, the, the um, custodial staff, knew them pretty well. Um, <laughs> when we were in college at West Liberty, um, we had to take about 18 hours of education classes before we could teach. And I'm sorry to say that I can't remember one thing I learned in any of those classes, except in Dr. Oldham's <laughs> introduction to education. And he told us that the two most important people that you would meet, that you would befriend in a school system were the janitor and the secretary. I was in like Flint. Because <laughs> between the two Georges and Mrs. Long, the high school secretary, um, I was covered. You see, during the summer, my dad ran like a, I guess you call it a truck farm, and he produced green beans, cucumbers, corn, um, potatoes, strawberries, raspberries, and he sold them to all the mom and pop grocery stores around the area. So um, naturally, some of the baskets would find their way down to these people. So we always took care of them. And they were friends of my dad's, and, and they knew me from the time I was little. Um, every year, when the word would get out that a certain teacher wasn't coming back, there'd be a knock on the door. There'd be one of the Georges. And they'd say, hey, Tom, um, so-and-so's not coming back. They have a really nice desk. You want it? <laughs> sure. Um, you should see the chair they have down there. Uh, they got a file cabinet. They got this. So my room was, was always stocked with the best furniture that you could get in high school. But I asked them if they had any idea of a room because I needed a room. And they said, no, there's nothing available. You have to remember now, this is 1968, and the student population of the high school was well over 1,200 kids. So every room was, was filled, and they, still nothing. They said, but, but wait, but wait. Down the hall, down the hall, at the end of the third floor, across from the physics lab, right by the chemistry lab, there's a janitor supply closet. Um, this is a remodeled high school. Trust me, it looked nothing like this in 1968. Um, and inside the closet, if I wanted it complete, had a kitchen table, had bookshelves, if I was interested in it, I could share it with them. Um, and the room, if you look at it, is about eight feet long, a wide and about 12 feet long. Um, it was a tight quarters. The paint was hanging off the ceiling, but it was at least a place to start. So without knowing it, the two janitors had set in motion the path to what eventually um, would become the Belair High School archives. Um, I thought we should start. I forget what the next one is. Um, that's what we started to get ourselves into. And again, um, the scrapbooks was a, a, a tremendous idea, but it was a, a lot of work. And we'll, we'll come back and look, look at that later. Um, I thought we should start collecting like old yearbooks, um, the Belgian one, Belair Junior Annual, so that the other staffs could look at them and see what people had done in the past, get ideas from them, things like that. So we started collecting those. Then we thought, well, what about the school newspaper, um, the Talisman, put together by Mrs. Martha Taylor? And if you knew Mrs. Martha Taylor, let me tell you, 
the articles were accurate, they were well written, and they were grammatically correct. So they had a lot of good material in them. So we started collecting the, the talismans. They say you don't have to point this thing. Football programs, basketball programs, why not? I mean, that had a list of um, all the things that um, the, the players, uh, the, the scores, the things that you wanted. So basically, the two Georges had introduced me to crack cocaine, and it was game on. The only problem is we started to get the journalism students involved because that same year, I have to back up a minute, the same year that we did this, I started, I talked to the Board of Education, the um, principal of the Board of Education, and they're letting us start a journalism course. Um, that, the students in there would prove to be a godsend to me, um, but we'll look at that later. But the um, students, we divided them up into groups and made a research material. Um, one of them, one, one group would go through and take all the uh, board approved graduates and make alphabetical listings of them. This was the very first page in the notebook of the class in 1878, uh, which was the first graduating <laughs> class. Um, you have to remember back in those days, there was a college prep, college scientific, um, commercial, um, industrial arts, general course, and they all had an alphabetical listing of their own as they graduated. So we had to combine all these. Then we take another class of kids and make them do the exact same thing. And then we take the two lists and put them together and see if they matched and see if everything was done correctly. And then somebody else would type them up. And then we thought, well, why not get a list of all the high school faculty members? So we started going through the books, list every single teacher that taught at the high school each year, um, what subjects they taught, what extracurricular activities they were into, things of that nature. Um, we started collecting athletic records because, again, believe it or not, no one ever tracked these things from, from years ago. Um, we started taking, students would take the current stat sheets after each football game, after each basketball game, um, and they would go through and, and see if there were any records, keep track of the scores. We started going back to the 1910 yearbook and collecting all the scores of all the teams we had played um, over at that point. Now, when a project like this starts, something funny happens. Um, people, people will start to call you and challenge you. Uh, well, you said so-and-so had this record. Well, my dad had this record, and we'll prove it. And then they give you the proof, and then you correct it. Um, we have some of these things that you might be interested in. So we found ourselves starting to collect things. We were in the business of collecting. We were like the original goodwill of all the, of the um, schools in the area. And we still needed more room. Well, it just so happened that the study hall, um, 336, um, the old orchestra room slash study hall had been divided into four smaller classrooms for special education students. But with the special education programs growing, they needed bigger rooms for them. So two of the rooms became available. Um, we jumped on it, tore the wall out between the two of them and started to build. Um, crude racks to store the scrapbooks in. Now you gotta look at this and, and think for a minute. There's over 50 scrapbooks in this area, there's a cord here. There's over 50 scrapbooks in this, these two stacks um, that date back to 1968, go up to 1999, and have every single article that you could think about. Um, we cut out all the sports articles. We cut out um, engagements. We cut out weddings. They used to put those in the paper. We cut out obituaries. We cut out anything that pertained to Blair High School was put into these scrapbooks. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we built old, we found old jewelry cases to put in um, class rings. We had commencement programs. We had um, different artifacts. Um, we had students, um, and this was one of the mine. We had students take football film um, and put it on the projector, go through. If it was broken, we we tape it up. Um, they took all the cans that the film came in 
and would, would still wool them down and paint them and relabel them. Um, those are all the football films. That, that's about two years worth of work that was put together. Um, there was a case down at the, the old field house of football films dating back to the 40s and the 50s. And one of the coaches at that point wanted to get rid of them because they were taking up too much space. So he just opened up the trunk and said, anybody wants them, get them, get them, get them out of here. We found out about it, fortunately, and we went down and said, look, we'll, we'll take all of them. Included in that case was a 1952 football game in full color, which was something you never saw back then. And um, also there was a, a football film from the um, Notre Dame Army football game that showed former coach Bud Boner drop kicking extra points. He was one of the last people to drop kick extra points. Um, after that was over, um, we they transferred into videotapes. And again, we collected all the videotapes. But we met with um, John Magistro, who was a coach at that point. Uh, Mike Sherwood, the athletic director, and impressed upon him that these films were not the coaches. Now I'll step on some toes here, but they belong to the high school because that's our history. That's our history, and they should be there. Um, John was phenomenal, uh, very good at making sure that each year after he got done reviewing the films that they needed, he would make sure that we got all the films to, to keep adding to the case, and we had a pretty good selection of them up there. I don't know if this practice is still being followed, but, but it should be. Um, you, you don't understand the, the tons of history that has been lost because coaches have been allowed to keep their film and their scorebooks and not leave it in the high school, um, which is, in my opinion, where it belongs. How, how would you ever replace something like that? That's the 1899 football team before they had a football team. Um, this was Sandlot. And, and again, this was one of the very first squads. That picture still up in the archives and is, is priceless when you look at it today. So then we started to obtain mannequins. And we thought we'll, we'll put um, old uniforms on them, um, clothing, jackets, everything from um, majorettes, um, band uniforms, anything that we could possibly um, find uniforms for, we, we'd put on there. Anybody recognize that? That's Kathy Crumley's uniform when she was a sheriff. Um, one of our one of our classmates was that was her uniform when she was sheriff. That's on display up there. So so still more rooms needed. And as the alumni, I had just become a member of the alumni association at that point. And as we started to have bigger and um, larger um, homecoming festivities they started to have tours of the school. So every year the alumni would come through the halls, they'd come through the archives, they'd see things that we had and say, look, I have this, would you be interested in that? And it continued to grow. As the population of the student population started to decline, more room became available. And, and before you knew it, um, 336 was once more one large classroom, it was the archives. Um, students got to work during the period painting walls, um, scraping, sanding, and refinishing the floors, categorizing, cleaning, memorabilia as it came in. Um, see, as, as students became painters. Students became janitors. Students became um, um, refinishers of any type. Um, they learned to take pride in what they were doing. They learned to understand what the history of the school was about, and they learned to... Um, more of what we, what we were trying to accomplish. Then in the late 90s came the remodeling and reconstruction period. And everything in the archives had to be packed up and put away um, during the reconstruction because we had no idea what was going to happen. Um, Steve Shalcross, who was the um, on the school board at that time, was also worked for Allen and Corey in North Belair. And they had just been bought out by Liberty Distributors in Wheeling. So the front part of their building was open. 
So he said, you can store everything in there. Um, we packed everything up, the maintenance department, um, transported everything up there. And then upon completion, it was all brought back to the high school a couple years later, but it found its way down to the basement because that was the only available rooms. And it stayed down there for a couple years um, until they found out that the old band room slash typing room or um, whatever was not no, any longer needed. So they moved everything back up on the third floor where it still resides today. Um, if you look at this, this is a, a long shot of the room. Um, I can't even tell you without exaggerating. Um, literally hundreds upon hundreds of artifacts of the high school, of the alumni, of people who graduated are laying in this room. Um, one bank of file cabinets. Um, there's several file cabinets, um, but every type of program, um, article, um, anything that was worth keeping is all filed in there. The, I had retired in 1999 and as such was no longer on the faculty. So the Alumni Association kind of took over the maintenance of the archives. And, and Bob Catellus was kind of the curator of the museum now, and, and he has done an outstanding job. Um, but it's overwhelming when you look at it because one person just can't do all that. I was blessed to have a lot of journalism students, a lot of hands, a lot of feet that could do stuff. At the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned the, the yearbook staff. The, the yearbook was a typical Valley yearbook, uh, but over a period of time, we had converted it into a, a book that had, was receiving national recognition for, for how it was put together and what it um, established. Um, this was one of my, my last yearbook staff in 1984 before I took a hiatus from advising books. Um, this display is still up on the wall, um, has pictures of all the old yearbook staffs, every yearbook staff I had, along with different articles um, and what they had done. Um, anyone recognize the circle in front? It's a clock from the bell tower. Um, I tried to move it because I wanted to get a good shot of the board and, and that's like it's bigger than I am. Um, <laughs> It, it was very impressive, but I thought, how neat. At first, I was like, seriously, why is this in here? But it's really a neat thing because to be able to stand right next to it and see it, you, you appreciate what you, what you have. Um, in addition to the archives on the first floor, we established a um, showing of all 72 Distinguished Service Award winners that the Alumni Association had dating back to um, Irvin Somerville, who was the very first one. And this is still on the first floor today. It takes the entire half hallway. So technically, my role as an archivist came to an end because I was um, had taken a job with the Ohio Valley Athletic Conference as the executive director. But my, my interest in athletic records was still there. While teaching and running a print shop back in the 80s, um, Sam Mumley, who was then the executive director of the conference, um, knew of my interest in sports records, and he asked me, would you be interested in researching um, the OVAC champions going back to 1943? Um, because they had absolutely no records. Um, and I thought, yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, at the same time, I was collecting and working with Belair Basketball on, on their records and their stats, not realizing the streak that was, was being developed. Um, to date, the Notebook of Champions, as we call it, it's an electronic file that has every single OVAC um, championship and the coaches of those teams listed in it, um, contains 3,104 championships. In addition to that, um, Spreadsheets, can't think of what they were. Spreadsheets were cre um, created that list 5,853 wrestlers who participated in the OVAC Rudy Mumley, um, OVAC Ron Mock wrestling finals. Um, 2,857 
players who play in the OVAC Sam Mumley Basketball Classic, 4,232 players who played in the OVAC Ron Rudy Mumley All-Star Football Game, a lot of names there, 7,200 musicians who played in the OVAC McDonald's All-Star Band, and 1,592 girls who participated in the Queen of Queens. Um, that's all now put together and, and, and safe. And the Belair basketball stats, uh, they've been working on um, 13,355 player stats in 27 categories. Um, I had the pleasure of keeping score and stats for 360 players. And if you add under the top of that 116 that I watched dating back to the Lee Patron, I've had the pleasure of, of seeing 476 athletes perform under seven head coaches. Um, and why I did that, um, I sat through 2,150 consecutive reserve and varsity games. Um, this was an event at the end of the, um, when I hit 2000 games, they brought, I had a presentation, they brought the coaches, some of the coaches back that I worked with um, and everything. They even gave me my very own swivel chair that I could sit on. Um, and I, I, I shouldn't say this, but I will. And it's my chair, except when Forrest Merriman gets his butt into it. <laughs> but um, it's not bad, it's not bad for, um, 51 years work. Um, but getting back to the subject, um, in going to the OVAC, um, my the interest slowed down until about 2004 when we inducted our very first class into the OVAC Athletic Hall of Fame. Um, this is what's over at West Banco Arena. Um, when it first started, I had just finished building a wall over there. And what you have to imagine is the first row having pictures in it and everything else being bare wall. We had no idea what we were getting into when we built it. But currently, this focuses or shows um, 332 athletic greats that we have honored um, during that time. And we've, we now have gone into our second wall. Um, after it was over, the induction was over, we were talking about wouldn't it be neat to have some place that we could take um, artifacts from these people and display them. Um, bells are going off again. Because keep in mind, you're talking um, Johnny Havlicek, Bill Mazeroski, the Negro Boys, Bobby Douglas, you're talking Sam Mumley, Rudy Mumley, George Cavalli, all the great names. And we said all this material, if it would be neat if we could show it somewhere. So he said, why don't we start a museum? And off we went again. This time we go to Ogilvy Park because we thought that would be the ideal place to put the museum. Um, after all, the Festival of Lights, the buses come in, they're waiting for it to get dark. They can tour the museum, walk around. The summer time, the families that are coming to the park, would it be a nice place to go? So we set up a meeting with Randy Worlds and asked him if he'd be interested in having the uh, museum located there. No. Um, it wasn't the right fit. And on top of that, he was afraid that if we asked for it, then another group would ask, and another group would ask, and they just didn't have the space. So he looks at me dead serious and he goes, um, did you ever think of going to West Bank or Arena? And I said, holy, are you kidding me? Um, yeah, the whole museum was there, the whole arena was there, and we had never even thought of it. So I made a quick trip down to see Denny Magruder, and I said, Denny, would you be interested in us having a museum there? Um, he gave us a green light and said, yep, yep, that was there. And you got to understand that at this point, the, the, if you can think back there, remember, the West Bank Arena, the Wheeling Civic Center, was nothing but a cold, gray, concrete walls of the buildings. There was no paint. There was nothing. The concourses were drab and dismal to walk down. But that would, would soon change. Uh, in, in typical Magruder fashion, um, he set us up with a, he gave us a green light and set us up with a meeting with um, Tom Sarah and the late Orphy Klempa, who's a, a Blair graduate, 
um, they ran Project Best, and they said, um, would they be interested to pick their brains and see what they thought? So I told them what we were interested in, and they said, absolutely. Um, we would be interested in helping you. Um, they set us up with architects um, who would um, make the displays, and then they were in charge of um, Carpenters Local 3 in Wheeling. Um, this always impressed me. These guys, after working all week long, had to come in on the Saturdays and work on projects. So their projects, um, when they did it, was to build the display cases. Um, as long as we supplied the um, glass and the wood, they would build the display cases. And if it wasn't for these gentlemen, this picture's in the museum also, um, if it wasn't for these gentlemen, um, this never would have would have happened. Um, the cases, we supplied the wood, we supplied the glass, bought everything. Um, Kevin Daler um, from Wheeling, Keith Phillips, who was also a Belair graduate, and I spearheaded the, the project, I guess. And before you knew it, um, 143 of these cases were around the walls of the arena. Um, each school was given their very own case to display just what they had. Um, and then there were other cases that were around there. After that was done, came eight floor cases to fill the empty vomitoriums. Um, those cases were dedicated to um, football, basketball, baseball, track, wrestling on a college and professional level. Um, and then after that came 15 cases underneath the windows of the south porch. Um, these cases were dedicated to sports that just didn't make the big cases and were just, I, I hate to use the word minor sports, but they were just minor sports. Um, after that came a, a giant floor to ceiling display case that was set up to put um, all the uniforms, both original and retro of athletic greats that were in the, high, that were in the conference. Our biggest problem, like always, was where in the heck are we going to get the material to fill these things? Because when you first looked at the first case, it was like, uh oh. Um, once the schools found out that they could display their athletic history on a larger scale, artifacts started to come in. Then we would talk to the um, Hall of Famers each time we inducted a class and said, look, do you have anything that you would donate to the museum? Then we were getting the reunions of the 50-year um, football all-stars. And when we take them around the building, um, do you guys have anything? And soon before we knew it, um, up the, the, the cases were filled. We started that up with displays. Um, this is one of the more popular and colorful displays of all the football helmets of all the schools in the conference that displays their logos, their colors, everything of that nature. They had banners made of each school. Now, when you're Belair, this is really simple because you just hang a banner up and put Belair on it because it's been Belair for 1878. But what we wanted was not to lose sight of the schools that were absorbed into a consolidation when the other schools were made. For instance, like these 10 schools um, all get together to form what's now River High School. And then you had schools that had multiple consolidations, like Buckeye Local. And you take Dillonville, Smithfield, Yorkville, Adena, Mount Pleasant, um, all those schools, and you make them into Buckeye North, Buckeye South, Buckeye West, Buckeye Southwest, Buckeye Local. Um, so we wanted to make sure that these schools were never forgotten and people could know where they came from. The other thing that was neat was once these started to um, the, the alumni started to see that these cases were there and they were being recognized and honored. They bought cases themselves, and a lot of the cases over at the arena in the stairwells right now belong to some of these schools themselves. Um, then we put up the um, athletic banners. There's over 50 banners of people who have had an impact on athletics in the Ohio Valley. Um, and, and these were really neat banners to see. Um, the OVAC Coach of the Year 
we've, we've started making sure that we went back to Frank Baxter from Bridgeport. Um, the, the OVC has honored 58 um, coaches since then um, for what they accomplished each year. Of, of those 58 coaches, 18 of them are now deceased. But what they did, what they accomplished will never be forgotten as long as this is, is up there. Like the coach of the year, the Mr. Matt display um, showcases 48 of the men who have won wrestling's top award. This display still blows me away every time I walk past it. This is, these are plaques from the West Virginia Sports Writers Hall of Fame that was in the Charleston Civic Center. Um, about eight, 10 years ago, they decided to remodel the arena the, the, the center, and they decided that these plaques were no longer um, fit the decor, so they got rid of them. Um, they stuck them in a room and said, look, if anybody wants them, you can have them. Um, Doug Huff, who was a member of the Sports Writers Association, um, found out about it, and we hopped in a truck and drove down and brought back every single plaque that had the Valley people on it. Now, if you look at these, Dan, Dan can probably verify this, but if you look at these, these plaques are all the embossed plaques that you, you see. Those are pricey right now, but when you put the relief pictures on top of each one of them, those plaques are probably in the thousands of dollars and they were going to be pitched. Um, I can't walk past this um, anytime I go down and not realize how blessed we are to have West Bank Arena and their willingness to do this for us. Um, like the sports writers plaques, the Dapper Dan plaques that used to be up in St. John Arena um, in Steubenville, when they remodeled their place, all the plaques were taken down and put down in the storeroom. Uh, we found out about it and went up and salvaged all these. And when you, you look at these plaques that go down the hallway, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful sight. Um, so much was, was collected that we had to build a storeroom inside one of their storerooms so that we could keep the extra stuff that we didn't need um, in there. This was one of the more um, popular, colorful displays. Uh, it's a giant map, 22 by 23, of the um, Ohio Valley Athletic Conference and all its member schools and its locations. It was designed and built um, by then County Engineer Don Pickenpaw, um, and, and it sh shows the, the conference in 2009. Um, the arena itself took on a new look. Um, all the walls were painted. Um, the floors were carpeted. Signage was erected. Um, the janitor, the, the maintenance crew that used to complain about these intruders that were coming into their territory and making this mess, once they saw what was going up and what was being done, like the journalism students, they started to take immense pride in, in what was being accomplished. And they're willing to do anything at all to help you, even to this day. The best relationship I have probably is, is with the maintenance staff over at the arena. You see George Snyder and George Miller still live. Um, they're still there. And the great part of this museum is that unlike other museums, it's free. Um, you don't have to pay to get into it. You can go to it anytime during school, um, during work hours, any of the events, and it's, it's, it's open to the public. If you have never been there, I would encourage you to go over and walk around it. Even if you're on a sports nut, I would challenge you to look over all these displays and get out of there in less than two hours. It's, it's um, very impressive. Every week, a, a group of seven um, dedicated <laughs> idiots, um, volunteers, um, meet and go clean the glass, um, polish the glass, clean the cases, rearrange the displays. Um, understand there's, there's, no, there's no lights, there's no glamour, there's no publicity. It's just on your hands and knees scrubbing cases and, and cleaning things. Um, <coughs> So back to the beginning of the presentation. Um, like I told you at the beginning, um, I'm not a historian. Um, I'm just like most people in this room tonight. 
Um, yeah, I, I do have a little construction ability. I do have a little woodworking skills. Um, I thrive on organizing things. But that's not required, and that's not the point of the presentation. Um, several years ago, when I realized that I was on a pretty impressive streak as Blair scorekeeper, I came across a book by Cal Ripken Jr., um, Baltimore Orioles, um, entitled Just Show Up. Um, Ripken had just passed um, Lou Gehrig, the New York Yankees Iron Horse, of playing in 2,130 consecutive games. And he said at that point, he said, I never worried about the streak. I never worried about it before. I never worried about it afterwards. I just showed up for work every day, did my job like I was supposed to. Um, and he did that without fail um, until he retired with 2,632 consecutive games. Now, people, that's got to be one of the most impressive streaks in athletic history. A um, man never missed a game for that long. The premise of the book was that everyone has a 2130 in them. Doesn't have to be baseball. Um, it could be something you work toward, commit to. You see, the key word, the key word is commit. <coughs> a person once told me that we can have no future if we don't honor and respect our past. And there's a lot of truth in that, a lot of truth. You see, what is on the third floor of Bolero High School could be and should be in every high school in the United States. What is that West Bank or arena? Could be and should be in every arena. Doesn't have to be sports, it can be anything, but it could be. It doesn't matter whether it's the Viaduct Society, the BHS Archives, the OVAC Sports Museum, basketball games, Rotary Club, doesn't matter. I belong to the Rock Hill um, Presbyterian Church. And over the last couple of years, we've done some remodeling projects. And after it's been over, the first thing that we did was decorate it with what? Pictures of old members, our old buildings, dating back to our mother church along McBain's Creek in 1809. Um, like most people in Belair, I visit the Sons of Italy on pasta night, and on the wall down there is a list of uh, pictures of all their past um, um, presidents. Nothing impressive, nothing major, but so important to keep that type of material alive. Two of my major regrets, two of my major regrets um, in this journey have been um, J.E. Giffen. J.E. Giffen was a bank president of First National Bank. The man had an unbelievable memory of every single building in the Blair Business District. When it was built, who built it, what store was first in it, who ran the stores, what businesses you entered from the streets and what businesses you entered from the alleys. The man had everything. I thought how neat it would be to sit down with him and get all this stuff recorded and put together. He's gone. Jimmy Mountain was the um, editor of the Times Leader. But more important, he had a tremendous memory of growing up in Bel Air. Um, his editorials reflected it. He knew families. He remembered events um, recorded that took place. And when he was in his final days, um, I visited him several times. And I said, Jimmy, can I bring a tape recorder down? And you just sit there and, and we'll just throw a topic out and you talk and just get this down on tape so I can have it. Um, the problem was he was too tired, too frail at that point to do it. Um, once again, too little, too late. The only problem, the thing was after he passed, um, we did put out a book of his editorials um, called Along the Way. And it, 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 I, I don't know how many of them were in there. But it, it captured and kept all those things. Um, I don't know if there's, there used to be a box of them up in the archives. I don't know if there still are or not. But it, it's a, a really neat thing. We, we were hoping to take um, 
do several books because Jimmy had written the, the, the to be to be mentioned in the Jimmy Mountain editorial was a high compliment. Um, if he if he called you out by name or called your family out, um, so you see in this whole in this whole thing tonight, I guess you have to understand it takes people, it takes people willing to be involved and to give of their time. The one thing that drives me up a wall. Is when you talk to somebody and they say, I, I just don't have the time to do that. Seriously, seriously, what are you doing with your time? Seriously, I'm talking to some of you. It takes people who are willing to commit to some a cause they believe in. I don't care what that cause is. And take part in it and do something about it. It takes people to look around their homes, to look around their businesses, to look around their schools, to look around their churches and decide what is it in here that we want to preserve to pass on to, to future generations and what can I do to help out? It takes people to find a George Snyder, it takes a George Miller, a Denny Magruder. Everyone, everyone in this room is capable of doing at least one of those things, ever. As I said before, it's really simple. You can have no future if you don't honor your past. So I leave you tonight with one simple question. One simple question. What is your 2130? You see, it's really easy to come down here and sit in a chair, smile, nod, say, oh, that's interesting, that's nice. That's good. But what are you willing to do to preserve the history of our heritage, to preserve our heritage? As for me, I have 483 more games to go. So I'm hoping to see some of you in the year 2034. Thank you. And as I told him earlier, I'm totally jacked at Erica for getting me into this. <laughs> but whatever. Um, anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Um, Winning Park. I, I've come to hate the word renovation. Weeding Park is renovating the, the, the downstairs of the White Palace, and they're taking, they, they used to be cases for Weeding, Tridelphia, Warwood, Lindsley, um, of their memorabilia. Um, I talked to, can't think of the guy's name, that runs Ogilvy, that runs the Ogilvy Golf Club. Um, God, you know, who? No, no, he used to run it. He used to be Tommy Ackerman. But, but anyway, he called and wanted to know if we wanted the material for the museum. Um, and he said, well, first we, we owe it to the alumni of those schools to see if they want it or if they're interested in it. After they have their dibs and take what they need or what want, whatever's left over, we'll give to you. I'm still waiting for the call, but we've never had it. Uh, but yeah, again, they didn't think that any longer belonged in there place. So hopefully some of it will come back. Some of it we have um, a couple of things we were able to pick up, but we'll still wait. Anyone else? Yes. Um, a friend of mine, Andy Doris, played for the Houston Oilers and was a big red. All of his memorabilia was lost in a fire where he had it stored. How preventable is this for fire proof? None. Not at all. And, and that, again, is a shame. The only thing is, you know, a lot of it were recording. That's why the spreadsheets, um, a lot of the digitalization of the stuff is there. Um, a scan, a lot of materials that, that have been in. So you lose them if you ever lost them. But the stuff that is in there right now is, is priceless. Um, 
I mean, it's you lose it if something ever happened to the arena. Um, and it, our our biggest fear is if the arena ever says, "Look, we'll go remodel, get it out," because I have no idea what we're doing. What we what we what we. I mean, it's way too much, Danny. I thought I didn't play football. My brother played football. But two of the most exciting plays that I think I have ever seen was one where Tom Motroff walked across the goal line, basically trotted across the goal line in the game against St. John. But by far the most exciting play uh, that I ever saw was Paul Zanakis running 108 yards. Just on, on a kickoff display. Yeah. Do you know whether or not that uh, film still exists? I don't know whether the 60, I think that was in 63 season. I don't I don't know whether that film is up there. I, I, I've lost track of what we've had. There's a, a list of all the film that's up there. And it was um, against St. John, I believe it was. Yeah. And that record, that record, um, he also ran, I think, six or eight touchdowns against Weir. Um, up at Weird and had, uh, I think, four of them called back, five of them called back. Um, but um, that record will never be broken unless they allow you to start taking recording from the end zone. You know, but I don't know if the film's still up there or not. And then again, that's the thing. A lot of it was lost. Yeah, he was, he was fast. Anything else? And we have a special gift, and it does come in its own case. <laughs> that's for you. Thank you so much Thank for coming. So much. And then we're going to torture you one more time. We have two raffles. Would you be our draw, drawing, drawing, draw, drawer? Drawer. Drawer. Blue ticket. Last four digits, 2560. Last four digits, 2560. Blue ticket. <laughs> <laughs> White ticket, last four digits, nine nine four nine. Nine nine four nine, last four digits. White ticket. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> And if we could uh, give one more round of applause to Mr. Tom Radizak. Thank you so much for all you've done and all you continue to do. Thank you. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And we'll be back next week. We have our last uh, lecture series next week. So um, we hope to see you again next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.